Sticker Bush Symphony is a piece of music composed by David Wise for the soundtrack to the 1995 SNES release Donkey Kong Country 2. While it was originally written to accompany the levels Bramble Scramble and Bramble Blast, it's likely that you've encountered it by some other means. In the nearly three decades since its conception, it has been used to underscore various memes and remixes, and as a result, has become absorbed into the cultural fabric of the internet itself. In this video, we'll be analyzing the song's drum groove, as well as learning how to play it. A truly modern musician, David Wise has a unique and imaginative compositional style that draws inspiration from a wide variety of sources. In an interview with Game Informer, we can see how central rhythm was to his process for composing the music to Donkey Kong Country. The, the, the process is, I, I would see the level, I would, I would see it working, I'd be able to play it, I'd be able to get a feel for the rhythm that it needed to be the speed. And then I'd, I'd, I'd go away, get my keyboard and bash a few ideas out, listen to a lot of music for ideas and inspiration and, and try and create something that, that hopefully brings all of those disparate bits together and mesh it into something. For the Sticker Bush Symphony groove, Wise employs a technique known as linear drumming, largely pioneered in the 1970s by drummers like David Garibaldi and Mike Clark. The main idea behind linear drumming is that no two voices of the drum kit are played at the same time. Instead, the individual sounds are stitched together like pieces of a rhythmic jigsaw puzzle. The resulting product is then perceived by the listener as being one coherent idea, with the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Before we move to the drum set, I want to take a minute to analyze the drum part in Ableton. If you want to skip ahead to the drum lesson, feel free to do so. There'll be some chapter marks in the timeline. So what I've done is I've isolated the drum part from the track itself so we can just kind of listen to it up close and personal and get a feel for what's happening. So what we're working with is a one bar phrase that I have on a four bar loop just so we can listen to it a few times and get a feel for it. You'll notice that the sounds involved are bass drum, snare drum, and a hi-hat mixing in open and closed sounds. Since we're dealing with 16-bit samples, there's not a ton of nuance in terms of dynamics. It's pretty much just the sounds arranged in time. So with that, one of the hallmarks of linear drumming is multiple parts happening within the same timeline. And what this does is it creates a sense of space and depth and perspective. So I think that it's worth examining each one of those components that make up the whole groove, looking at them in isolation and even practicing them that way, so that when we reassemble everything and put it back together, it's going to sound much more um, convincing. So with that in mind, what I've done here is I've converted the audio to MIDI, so we can just look at what the bass and snare drums are doing. Let's hear that. So super simple, drum set 101, basically like the first groove that anybody who sits down behind the drum set for the first time, this is kind of like what they go for. And basically the identifying characteristics are here is that you have backbeat in the snare drum, meaning it's playing on two and four, kick drum on beat one, and then what sort of spices it up is this little syncopated pattern in the kick drum, which is the ah of two and then e and of three. When I'm counting 16th notes, I like to use one e and a. That's just what I learned and works for me, but you can adapt it to whatever works for you. So the first ingredient that you need is to really be able to just play a backbeat really solidly. If you can do that, you're going to be well on your way to being able to play this. Um, other than that, if you practice then just these components together, the interplay between the kick and the snare, you're going to basically be like 75% of the way there um, to being able to play this groove. So moving on, let's look at what the hi-hat's doing. So the first thing that you'll notice is that the hi-hat is starting on an offbeat. It's starting on the E of 1. And so let's add in the metronome so we can get a feel for time. 
One, two, three, four, one. So, as we'll see when we get to the drum kit, but playing open and closed hi-hat together cleanly involves a bit of technical ability, um, and we'll look at how we can work on that. But in the meantime, I think just, you know, trying to play this on its own accurately will have a lot of benefit. And when you're ready, you can start incorporating the rest of the drum kit so you can try leaving out the bass drum and playing the backbeats with the hi-hat. And then vice versa, you can try leaving out the backbeats and playing the bass drum. And then eventually you'll get to a point where you can kind of try and tackle the full groove and then that sounds like this. So now that we have a sense for the different parts and how they fit together, I think there's one other way that we can look at this that will be beneficial. And I'll preface it by saying that it's one thing to be able to learn a piece of music and recite it. I like to think of music more in a linguistic sense. If I'm going to spend a lot of time learning something, practicing it, I want to be able to get as much mileage out of it as possible, meaning that when I'm in different musical situations, I want to be able to use the things that I practice. So with that in mind, what I've done here is isolated beats one and two, and then beats three and four. And this will give us a little bit more of an in-depth understanding of how this beat is constructed. So let's just listen with that in mind. Let's listen to what beats one and two sound like by themselves. Now the first thing that you'll notice is that I've deactivated the kicks off of the Oz of beat two. And let me explain why I've done that. I think that the essence of this feel is this elemental pattern. 1EN, 2EN, 1EN, 2EN. This is something that if you really get a good handle on, you will use this a million times in your drumming life. So I think it's worth looking at it in this way. And then you can add in the, uh, you, can, you can practice the specific groove itself, and that will also be beneficial to you, but in a more global, universal sense. Just working on this very elemental concept will have a great deal of benefit in my opinion. And then furthermore, once we move on to beat three and four, we'll see something else kind of interesting along the same lines. So you'll notice that beat two and beat four are basically the same thing. In terms of the specific groove, the only difference is that you have in beat two, you have the kick on the ah of beat two, but on beat four, that's missing. So it's another reason why I think it's kind of uh, useful to practice that just elemental pattern and then adapt it later. And then building off of that, if we just look at beat three, you have this hi-hat and then the kick drum playing on E end and then the hi-hat on the ah, that's really kind of the crux of this whole groove. If you can kind of get a handle on that, Everything else is pretty simple. So when we get to the kit, we're going we're gonna to look at that. The last thing I'll say is that it's just when we look at the groove in its totality, basically, once again, just driving home that this is a linear drum part, is that you have that elemental groove, boom, ga, boom, ba, boom, ga, and then the hi-hat is just playing where the bass drum and snare drum aren't. The only times that you're not playing is on the ah of one and the ah of four. So with that, let's move over to the drum set and see how we can actually play this beat. So before we dig into this groove, let's just take a second to review what we discussed in the last section. So we have a backbeat in the snare drum. One, two, three, four. With the bass drum. Here's the hi-hat part. One. Two. 
Here's everything together slow. At tempo. So before we actually look at how to practice this, uh, there's a couple other things I want to mention. So first and foremost, as a drummer, you always want to be thinking about the arrangement of whatever it is that you're playing, meaning the structure of the piece, the sections and how they fit together, as well as the instrumentation, what instruments are playing what parts. The reason why this is important is because the more in tune you are with the arrangement of the piece, the better you're going to be able to structure the shape of it, and the more people are going to want to play with you, basically. So with that said, as I was analyzing and dissecting uh, this piece for this video, I noticed that there was this synth pluck part that basically plays through the whole piece and kind of remains static. And this synth pluck part really kind of serves as the glue to kind of tie everything together. So not only is it important to the harmony of the piece, it is also mirroring the rhythm of the bass drum, particularly the syncopated figure in beat three. And so it's helping to kind of add some color notes to the chord changes but it's also adding some rhythmic propulsion or contributing to the rhythmic propulsion and forward momentum of the song. So if we keep that in mind, when we're practicing and when we're playing, you can kind of use that synth pluck part as an anchor to help kind of make everything gel. So if the bass drum rhythm is this, We can see how though that part lining up with the bass drum really kind of helps everything, gives it some uh, cohesiveness. It's kind of like some glue. Um, and in addition, so just so that, you know, drummers need to know music theory as well. So keeping in mind that that synth pluck part is, well, the, the piece itself is written with the Aeolian mode which, if you don't know what that means, it's basically a C major scale starting on A, which gives it a minor tonality. And the static synth pluck part, as the chords are changing, it's offering different color tones, meaning like it, it might be playing like the seventh and the ninth and, and the third of one chord and then like a sharp 11 of another chord. And it's kind of cool because it's the same notes, but as the chords are changing, it's creating a you know, it's creating different um, harmonic effects, let's say. Now, as we move into the mechanics of how do we actually play this groove, um, I'll just make one more note about linear drumming. So the trick with linear drumming is that you have to be very precise with your movements. The reason for this is because everything, it's, it's, a, it's very intricate. It's a very intricate art form. And so if you are off a little bit with one element, it can kind of throw everything into chaos. So it's worthwhile not only practicing your technique apart from the style, but spending time really looking at the different parts where things are happening together, happening apart, on all these little kind of moments of what I call the choreography of where your body needs to be and at what time to effectively execute whatever the groove is. So what I found with this beat is that the left foot is extremely important. So the left foot, if you just analyze what the left foot itself is doing, it's a very simple pattern, it's this. Extremely simple, but there's a trick to it. 
So just a note on technique, it's technique itself. Um, for this, I, I prefer um, the toe stroke. You could use a heel stroke, but I find that how I sit at the drums, the toe stroke helps me kind of keep my weight under me. So I'm not struggling to keep my balance when I'm playing. So just getting, just developing your toe stroke is going to be extremely effective and applicable uh, to playing this beat. But the rhythm is one, two, three, one, two, three, four. But the trick is this preparatory upstroke on the and of four. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E up. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E up. The reason why this is so important is because it's like the engine, like when you turn the key of a car and it's the engine turning over, it's setting everything in motion. And the right foot is doing the exact same thing. And those two feet are coming down together on the downbeat of one. So if we just look at that moment for a second, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E up, two, three, four up. It's extremely elementary, but it, it, it is absolutely vital to executing this beat correctly. So with that in mind, if we just look at just the feet together, because they're kind of the foundation of the whole thing, we would get this. Bear with me, I might make, make some mistakes, but uh, here we go. Up. 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 So we can see kind of how important that is that moment of bringing up and then down into beat one. And then now when we add the rest on top of that, we have the foundation. Everything else is there. It's just a matter of negotiating what the hands are doing at that point. So just practicing that would help a lot, help to kind of get everything to, to coalesce. Moving on from there, now what we have to kind of deal with is we have some moments where things are, are playing together at the same time, things are playing apart. So we want to look at how to get these things to fit together seamlessly. Now, if we remember back to the analysis section, uh, I highlighted that basically this pattern is basically the same. Beats one, two, and four are basically the same. They're basically playing off of this elemental pattern. And the only difference is this. The only difference is this on beat three, right? So that spending time just looking at that, just looking at this um, this moment of beat three, I think is well is time well spent because what happens is you have. Just what we were talking about a second ago, the and of uh, and a four, three e and a four e and a one again, three e and a four e up one. But there's something else that's really kind of tricky in there, and that's the ah of two and the downbeat of three. So you have in the full pattern, if I play from the beginning slowly, one e and a two e and sorry, that ah in the bass drum on two followed by the downbeat of a closed hi-hat in the right hand on beat three. So we have a tricky little thing going on here because what we need to do, ah uh, three, we need to get the right foot down on, on the ah uh, of two, the left foot down on one, but we also have to sync that perfectly with the downstroke in the right hand. So there's a, a very kind of tricky coordination thing going on here. And um, especially because this is what I call a cross lateral connection. This is the right hand playing in unison with the left foot. Not easy to do. So just spending time, if that's troublesome for you, you can just spend time, like put the metronome on, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four bad, one E and a two E and a three E and a not great, one E and a two E and. And really spending time getting those to kind of line up correctly. And the reason why this is important, the reason why you don't want to have the left foot and the right foot coming down together on ah is because you're not giving that 
that open hi hat its full note value, and that's that's an important thing, and that's gonna you know it's something that you want to pay attention to. So, with that in mind, now let's look at how we can actually kind of practice this once we spend some time. So uh, basically, it would be like let's see. Um, oh yeah. So then we might want to work on something like this once we kind of have that uh, that little moment kind of sorted out. We might want to look at something like this, just playing beat three into beat four. So I'm going to play the pickup in the bass drum. So uh, three E and a four, just that. You can do it in time or out of time. And there's actually benefit to just kind of doing it out of time and treating that downbeat of beat four, like putting like a train tracks in, in a score. This is like a um, notation thing. Basically, that means that it's an indefinite pause. And what that's going to do is it's going to give your brain and your body a chance to get on the same page. And you're going to create the neuromuscular connection much faster uh, by doing things like that, by taking time in between each repetition of that pattern. So. Once again, that was, um... and then if you want, you can go a little further. And then just let that hi-hat ring out. And there's kind of like a little zen moment in there where you can just let that thing ride off into the sunset before you try it again. So those are some ideas with working with that moment. Now let's look at how we can actually put the parts together. So once again, looking at or going back to what we talked about in the analysis section, if we think of beat one and two, which was this, leaving out that pickup note in the bass drum, if we call that A, we might practice something like this. Repeat A three times and then rest. So that would look like this. Here's A, two, three, Rest. Again. And just loop that over and over again. And the reason why, again, it's kind of like the same principle by putting that rest in there, at the end, it gives our mind and body a chance to get on the same page, and it's going to expedite the process of learning uh, the muscle memory. So we can do then the same thing with B. So if this is B, we might want to loop that three times. So we might go like this. Two, sorry. Three, rest. One, two, three. And repeating that over and over again. And then the next, another thing that you can do, another fun thing that you can do, you can either try and put the whole thing together from there, but another fun exercise is to loop A or B and then randomly mix in the other one. So that might be something like this. If I'm just going to loop A, it would be this. Sorry, my high hat. And all I'm doing there is I'm just repeating A, and then whenever I feel like it, throwing in a B. And what this is going to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help increase your fluency. It's going to make it much more of a, so again, going back to the idea from the analysis, more linguistic. It's going to be more like a conversational thing that you can interject this idea at will instead of just being reciting a, a, a pattern. And... It's also gonna, it's gonna increase the fluency and the forward momentum and your ability to just kind of keep playing no matter what. So, and then you can do the same thing. You can loop B and interject A. So that would be.
kind of just gives it a little, you know, it's, it's a little more useful that way. And that way, when you're in a, in a musical situation, you're going to be able to kind of play these little phrases and use them in musical context. So with that, let's just put the whole thing together and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much for your time and for watching this video. If you found it useful, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Other ways that you can support the channel are by streaming Intermotion Music on your streaming platform of choice, and if you're so inclined to make a one-time donation, links to my coffee and Venmo pages will be below. I'm trying to raise enough money to buy a new hi-hat clutch. Thanks again, we'll see you in the next video.